Welcome to the Recruitment Mentors Podcast. My name is Hisham Azuz. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Justin McGuire and Dan Matthews, who have recently become the co-founders of DMCG Global. Before this, Justin was a founder of his own recruitment business called MCG & Co that he founded in 2010 and successfully grew that business across Dubai, Hong Kong and Singapore. And also previously, Dan was the founder of his own recruitment business called Daniel Marks, which he also successfully grew in London, Europe and America. And actually, both of them uh, built recruitment businesses that service the creative marketing and advertising sector, but have now joined forces along with Alan Smith, Adam Topton to form DMCG Global. Absolute pleasure having you on here, guys. How are we? Hello. Always well. well thank you. Well. <laughs> Good. Good so. Justin is joining us from Singapore for context and, and Dan is joining us from New York. So morning and evening. So I think the, the comparison there is Dan's joining us with a big jug of coffee and Justin's got a whiskey, was it? I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, so where I want to start, Justin, I'm coming to you first. Like in your opinion, what characteristics and traits do you think make up a highly successful recruitment consultant? Hi, Hisham. So, um, I think the characteristics you need to succeed in recruitment are really down to, it's an attitude. You've got to have the right attitude to succeed. You know, we can teach the skills. I often look for people who are hungry, who are determined, who are passionate, you know, all those uh, words thrown in. But ultimately it's someone that, that really is a good salesperson because it is a sales job and that's someone that's willing to learn and is incredibly resilient. Mm, love that. Dan? Yeah, I completely agree. Um, completely agree. Uh, I think relationships are very important. You've got to be a people person. You've got to understand relationships, communication, uh, repetition as well. Um, it's doing the same thing well again and again, uh, not stopping and keep on going. Um, you've got to be resilient. Uh, yes, yeah, there's lots of things that do make you good recruit. It's hard to box it into a few words, but um, those are the things I would say are the things that stand out to me. Okay. So... What I'm excited to dig in with you guys is that starting DMCG Global, um, talking about your journeys and taking your career and businesses international, um, speaking to you, Dan, around the sort of licensee agreement that you now offer um, people to join DMCG Global. But where I want to start really quickly, Justin, let me come to you first. But from what I look and see online, right, you worked in recruitment two years before yeah. you started your own recruitment business yeah yeah let's talk about that for right. a second like what <laughs> what what gave you the right or confidence to start like what why, why did you take the plunge with that, that little experience because some people never take that first step even though they may have way more experience than that so what what helped you take the plunge well, to put it into context, I, I wasn't a spring chicken. I was 30 years old when I started. It, but, <laughs> you know, I was, I, there, was a, there was flex of grey. But I'd, um, I'd worked in the industry. I'd worked in the communications industry for seven years. And my journey into recruitment was on the basis that I worked in, in digital comms. And no one, I couldn't find a recruiter that really understood what I did. So I saw that there was an opportunity to get into recruitment because no one really knew what I did. And I, I then proved that I could do it when I was working for someone else pretty successfully. And um, then the, the the financial crisis came across in, in, in 2008 and I, I lost my job. So I got I was I was I was a bit stranded and at, the point, at this point I'd accepted a job in Dubai. So I I'd, I'd moved out to uh, another part of the world. The financial crisis came in. Uh, I ended up doing long story short, I ended up doing facilities management recruitment, which I knew nothing about. I mean, this is a guy <laughs> that did comms and advertising for and then moved into facilities management. It was essentially placing security guards as far as and toilet cleaners as far as I was concerned. I knew nothing about it. <laughs> so step stepped out of that and uh, and really thought, what have I got to lose? Um, because I could use my experience from working in the industry and my short but sweet, successful time of recruiting in that industry. And I was in a position. I was in a, uh, a place like Dubai, where there was a massive opportunity. There was um, Dubai had been given quite a lot of cash from Abu Dhabi. Uh, it was starting to grow again quite quickly and recover from the financial crisis. And there was no talent there. So it was it was it was it was a, an unsuccessful journey when I first moved out to Dubai because the financial crisis happened. And then I ended up being the right guy in the right place at the right time because Dubai started to grow. And I just thought, what have I got to lose? Let's, let's give this a crack. And it, look, it was, 
um, optimism, uh, naivety, a bit of stupidity, and uh, perhaps a bit, a bit, a bit of youthfulness still that was in a thirty-year-old. And you started that on your own, right? Just for context. Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah, that was right. I mean, I had I had a problem starting it in Dubai in the sense that it was great that there wasn't any talent there, but also there, there genuinely wasn't anyone there. So uh, I couldn't, I, could, I ended up going back to the UK quite a bit just to find talent and start moving people out there and actually ended up doing a split time between the UK and Dubai. Um, and I had this office in, um, well, I was living with my girlfriend and our wife at the time, just in Dalston. And um, it, was, it was basically a, above a, a lawyer's, and the people, when people used to call me, they'd think that this office was really busy because the lawyer underneath, the floorboards were so thin and he had such a loud voice. It sounded like I had someone in the office with me. And my, my Dubai clients thought I was this big shot recruiter who had offices in London and Dubai. And it was just me on my, on my Jack Jones, who was just going <laughs> bouncing backwards and forwards between the two. But I managed to, um, you know, basically promote Dubai. Uh, when a lot when people were kind of losing their jobs still in the financial crisis so i was bringing out that first wave of sort of digital talent to the middle east in 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 2010 that was then and uh, and i didn't really look back from then yeah no I, that's really interesting and dan i had the sort of same question for you but instead what i want to get your thoughts on so thinking of what so hearing what justin just shared there mm. Do you see sort of some of the similar sort of things happening now with, with COVID? So from my lens, I've seen so many recruiters start their own business during yeah. this period because of that question, isn't it? It's like, what's the worst that can happen? I've been made redundant or I've been doing this, I've been doing this job now for the last six months from my from my living room. Like, why can't I do this myself? And yeah, sort of this environment has encouraged it. So what have you, because obviously you're now having conversations with recruiters about DMCG Global, et cetera, like, what have you have you found that has that sort of translated into 2020 um yeah it has i mean my markets have more been the developed markets london europe uh, america they've always been very competitive so you've got to have a bit of an edge uh and support network over your competitors i suppose um what we're offering is people the opportunity to sort of run their own business with our support um, a lot of the people who we had at Daniel Marks, who were, um, you know, most people had six, seven, eight years experience, who were kind of running their own desk autonomously. Um, when my MD moved on last year, uh, I didn't need to replace him because people actually were very much a case of running their own desk and treating it like a business. So what we've done here, this license agreement is pretty much to take that to the next level and say, look, you are now literally running your own business. This is your business that you can then ultimately sell. So you're responsible for yourself, you're autonomous, um, but you have all of our support, operations, finance, marketing, products, platforms, services, uh, and they take like 70, 80% of the lion's share of what they make. So it, it's kind of a, a mix between taking a step on your own. So it's doing it on your own, but doing it with our support. So it's a nice middle ground for people that do want to run their own business, have the autonomy, flexible working, unlimited holidays, and, and working under around their own schedule, but not be completely isolated on their own. Because as Justin said, it's not, not nice being on your own. I worked on my own uh, for a couple of years when I set up Daniel Marks in my living room with a couple of mates in Putney, uh, and it was pretty pretty lonely. Uh, there's no one's no one's ear to chew, no one to share successes, no one to collaborate with, and it's probably one of the hardest things about setting up your own business is that you are on your own, um, and that, that can be quite soul destroying um, and, and actually quite demotivating uh, to a degree. So having a support network and people around you to help. Um, is actually one of the things I think helps our licenses, our licensees, our businesses to to really grow and expand with the, with the support and the collaboration. And okay. the really having other people to, we've got a, a Zoom chat, uh, we've got a webinar later with like 25, 30 people, uh, a Zoom chat on Friday where everyone's going to get together and just chew the fat uh, and having other people to sort of, uh, to, to the age with and work with. Okay. We're, so, okay, cool. So we're, we're definitely going to dig into that. So I guess let's just go into this then. So, Justin, like, why, why? Let's just talk a bit about like why you guys have joined forces, right? Because there's a couple of you that obviously have have formed DMCG Global. So let, hit us with the the why have you decided to do that? Okay, so it, the the obvious one is that we recruit in the same sectors. So yeah. if you were to, you know, there was a a marriage in the sense that we shared the same clients, we shared the same skill sets, uh, excitement about the industry, etc. Dan and I, um, actually, probably the first bit is Dan and I know and trust each other. We've known each other since we were kids. 
to our, yeah. our, uh, our, our parents were friends. So that's, yeah, that's a, that's a massive box ticked. We work in the same sectors and we both tr tried and, and, and essentially, well, I can certainly for myself and, and failed in elements of trying to scale our business as well. And it, it's not very, it's, you know, it is very difficult trying to take, you know, it was even diff it, it was very difficult having a business in Dubai and opening up in Hong Kong and Singapore. And that, and then I tried to move a business and open up in London and I had a real tough time doing that. And I, and I, I pulled back and shut that office after a year. So I had an experience of tri trialing Europe and realized it, you know, I couldn't do that on my own. And Dan was interested as well in, in coming into the Middle East and Asia. And again, he was pretty stretched because he was opening up in the US and Europe as well. So it made sense for us to pull our resources together, particularly after we'd both given or experimented in expanding into the markets that we reach in as well. Mm, that makes sense. So Dan, what, from your perspective then, so Justin has given us why, like what would you say has been the most positive impact so far since joining forces? Because this, if you mm. were to talk about this maybe five, 10 years ago, how many recruitment business owners would you hear talking about collaborating and actually forming another business with competitors? Not sure, right? Yeah. So like, what, what, what's been the po most positive impact so far from your perspective? Well, there's been so many positive impacts, actually. Um, like I said, I'm adjusting for, I don't know, Christ, 30 years or something. Uh, our parents know each other very well. I think I was actually working in Sydney at the time when Justin was launching. No, actually, no, I was, I'd already done that. I was back in London and running Daniel March, and I heard that Justin was doing what he was doing in Dubai. And I thought, that's great. I should catch up with him. And I was in Dubai every now and then. Uh, caught up with him and we just said, look, when we start to do things together, I've gone west, you're going, you've gone east. It makes sense to collaborate. Um, what's been really good is having uh, a global unity. So we've got shared clients, which we can share globally, um, shared resources uh, on certain things from products and services, uh, even, even certain hires we've made in marketing, we can share resources on that. Um, having someone to talk to, um, you know, in fact, we did anyway. Actually, we did speak quite regularly just about the, the trials and tribulations of running a business. Um, but it's, it's having a community, a wider community. So we've got our patch of London, Europe and USA. But having colleagues and co-workers in other parts of the world is really quite energizing. Um, you know, the sun never sets on, on DMCG Global. It sounds a bit cheesy, but it's kind of true. So I've got messages coming in. We've just appointed someone for Sydney, which is a JV between myself, Justin and Alan. So this person's starting in a couple of weeks. And, you know, is it, we, like, like, like myself, Justin's always working. We just kind of enjoy it. It's kind of our life work hybrid. Um, so having something going on all the time, I really enjoy um, in the okay. morning, UK stuff in the evening, it's Asia. Uh, but I think the collaboration piece, the uh, someone else to talk to, someone else to bounce ideas off, someone else to implement ideas, and obviously shared costs allow us to operate this on scale. Yeah. So go on, Justin. Yeah. Well, no, I was just going to say the, the, the other thing is let's put COVID to one side, but we live in a connected society in a connected world. And, and actually, the flow of talent, what we were finding was that it's, it, you know, in Singapore or Dubai, I could have then someone on site and on the ground in London if I wanted to relocate someone who go and meet candidates or go and meet clients or can go and mm. discuss sort of global. That was a real unique selling point for us as well and something that we, a real added value that we could offer people. Um, and the other nice thing for Dan, I guess, is that I was in Asia when I, I knew this COVID tsunami was coming. Mm. And I, I was I was like the warning system, you know. I could I could I could mm. tell Dan that there was you know be prepared, buckle up. This bad boy's coming in. <laughs> we were about to make some more hires, weren't we, in, in Amsterdam, yeah. London, and you were like, I think we should put the brakes on. Right, yeah. Like, no, so, no, yeah. And you're like, no, no, seriously, this this thing is coming. Um, yeah. So it helped me to be probably more reactive uh, and realise how big this thing that was hitting us was back in March, having had that insight from Justin. So thank you, mate. <laughs> yeah, so this, so look, the, I actually, I think that's so unique, and I absolutely love that. So look, Justin, let me ask you this then. So not just um, you two, but also the other chap involved. Like you've gone from being a business owner, you make your own decisions, and being only responsible for your own decisions. That's a big reason why people start their own business to have that freedom of decision choice, right? So positives, great. But how have you managed now to that you can't just be like, right, wake up, Justin is going to decide to do this. There's other people involved now, right? How have you, yeah. how's that been? How's, how's that been? Well, I think it helps the fact that we, we knew each other. So with Dan mm. and I, it's never, we've, we've, we've never really come to any sort of blows on anything. And 
you've just got to accept if you're going to merge and you know parts of the business together or, or you know build something new together then you're going to have to compromise and you're just going to have you can't go and do whatever you want and you're going to have to listen to other people's thoughts and opinions and what i what i what you also learn as a business owner is particularly after 10 years is that you're not necessarily right all the time and that is quite <laughs> good to get other people's opinions as well and you should listen to them um and and with alan who joined us in australia well adam uh, and adam my my business partner at mcg beforehand we obviously knew each other and adam and i worked very closely so i i already had someone to bounce off with there and uh, with Adam. And then I'd met Alan about two years before we actually ended up doing this as well. Firstly, he was referred to me by a client in Dubai saying, oh, you got to meet this guy in, in Australia. He does the same thing as you. So when we met him, it was like meeting an Aussie <laughs> Justin and Dan, right? So it was a very easy stitching. And he was interested in growing, but also was a bit, you know, put off by the or daunted by the fact that going into another country was a big step for him and he'd already been burned setting up a business in Perth and then moving it to Brisbane so he'd like uh, like me certainly and and and, and like Dan's degree he'd had you know he'd experienced the good and the bad of trying to expand a business so he was bought in mm. okay. we were looking for a JV in Sydney me and Justin and we were inquiring about uh, an acquisition or just hiring good heads down there and then when Alan came into the picture um it seemed like a natural uh, thing to, to join that part of the puzzle together to have someone on the ground in Australia because again we're both so stretched on timing like my days are very long as are Justin's because he's dealing with Dubai in the morning and so having someone on the ground and someone who's got a reputation a footprint a business a great reputation um, it made sense to us all come combine together uh, and now we're pressing ahead with Sydney um, and it's, it's all sort of uh, the cogs are, are clicking into place yeah so, so it seems like if I'm listening right now and I'm thinking about joint ventures, that the main recipe that you have to have is, is trust, um, yeah. clearly, yeah. right? So, yeah. so really quickly, Dan. I so I just want to ask you this, just and, and then I'd, I'd really appreciate if you just really just spell out the licensee agreement that you guys have put together. And I know Justin, you're trying to formulate the best way to do, replicate this also in um, other areas, mm. but. The commercials, right? So just make this really clear. So I'm a recruitment business owner, listen to this, or a future recruitment business owner. Joint venture sounds great. More people involved, global footprint. But like, how do you actually structure this then? So is it the, yeah, so the, Dan, the London business, that you you own that business, but then other people are directors that have part ownership of that business. Like how how do the actual commercials work? Yeah, no, that's a good, good, good question. Um, a licensee would have their patch and their, their specialism. So it could be someone that specializes in uh, web developments or cyber security or uh, planning and strategy. So their license would be for that particular type of uh, sector. Um, and it's done by territory as well. So some people are UK, some people are USA, some uh, like Natasha's Amsterdam. Wait, wait, sorry, sorry, is this the licensee, yeah? Yeah, the licensee. So, so, but just quickly now, as a recruitment business owner, so like Dan, Dan Matthews, Justin, like how have you structured it in terms right, of the okay. actual, the actual so, just quickly on that, because I think people yeah, will be so, interested in how you've done that. If there's, a, if there's someone who specializes, like I say, in web developers and that's their thing, they set up their own business, which we assist them with. It's a limited business. It could be called uh, I Am Limited. That I Am Limited has a license agreement with DMCG Global. Okay. And that license agreement provides, we is, is actually very weighted in their favor um, as a partnership. So we, we are sure we're going to give them everything that they need to be successful. It's, it's even like training, development, sources, probably all products, services, operations. But they get all of those things included and uh, they will then operate as their own business, as a licensee, akin to a franchise, really. Um, there's no sort of, I suppose, financial commitment to either party. Um, so if it's not working, that's absolutely fine. And we've chained in. We're, we're, we want to work with partners that are commercial and want to make this work. Um, does that make sense? Does that clarify how it works? Yeah, I mean, yeah. Sorry, I think the, the re what I was what I was trying to the reason why I cut you off there, Dan. So that's the licensee, right? I guess what the question was. Sorry if this isn't clear. Was basically I was interested in if I if I was in the position of you and Daniel Marks, how mm -hmm. have you structured it? Where I don't know how you structured it from a you, I go from Daniel Marks being the sole owner of that business to now being. Um, a co-founder of DMCG Global. Mm. Commercially, how have you structured that with Justin, with Alan, with Adam? That's what oh, I was right. interested in because no, I think people would be interested in that. How do you yeah, that? I've got my patch, which is UK, Europe, and USA. So I'm, I, I can point licensees in those territories. Right. And 
those licensees would then have their own business, which is has the uh, license agreement, which they can then develop and grow and then ultimately sell. And it's all theirs to keep it when they sell it. And then someone else might take that license on. And it's actually easier to sell a license agreement than selling a business because you might be a one or two man shop. Um, so that, that's how it works. And people have a patch, a territory. And, uh, and and a specialism that could be planning a strategy it could be uh like i say it could be a, a, a niche of cyber security we don't want to be limiting people but they've actually got the air that they think they would they would work on if it's an air which is not untouched no one's working they can obviously go with it but no one's got a license that's restricted beyond like they it's not they can't do things they'd want to do so it's their specialism but there's it's, we've actually pointed to a person recently in London who's dealing with the sales side of things so no one was dealing with national sales advisors sales directors sales managers so it doesn't it doesn't encroach on anyone else's patch um we're looking at bringing on someone next year to do accounting and finance for all our clients with all the media agency consultancy clients someone to focus on the accounting and finance side of things so it's we're going to stick to our core but then you can radiate out from that yeah, sure. And then just because obviously recruiters want to know this. So if I was to become a licensee within DMCG Global, so you've mm. explained sort of, yeah, the, what you'd support them with um, and how it would work. But like, so if I, how does it work with earnings then? Because I know you made this quite simple yeah. when we spoke. Yeah, but like, how does that work? If they make a placement and say the fee is 20 grand, um, they would get between 14 and 16 grand of that. So we take care of all the invoicing. We just process all that. We've got two people that specialize in just invoice chasing. So we'll raise the invoice, get the money, and then we pay that person within five days. So we basically, if they make a placement, we collect the money and just pay them straight away. And we pay them as their own limited business. So um, if it was I am limited, we would pay I am limited. And that person can then pay themselves how they want to. They can pay themselves a salary. They can pay themselves in dividends. Uh, they can, you know, buy tech and stuff that's tax deductible it's running their own business essentially and we've got financial sort of forecast for them so they can work out how they're going to manage it but it's essentially running your own business and we, we we support that nice and then justin for you then what's been the journey so far in trying to replicate that in your part of the world yeah it's um so we have in singapore dubai and hong kong we've got expats quite a few expats in our business and yeah. quite a few le legal uh, should we say loopholes to jump through to get an expat to set up an independent business that franchises into uh, a holding group so we've got to run a bit of a hybrid model there so for yeah. local it's um we, we can we can do this plug it and play um design and structure that dan's just run through but for expats for quite a few of them particularly in hong kong and singapore you need to um, you, you need to basically have a salary to work here and that doesn't obviously having your own business then and plugging in on a franchise model doesn't work very well so we have to we just have to adopt to the rules that, the, that there are in in the different territories that we have um so for locals we can run it for expats we 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 run a more typical kind of recruitment salary and commission structure but sure. from talking to people um the bit that everyone loves you know is is the big bit about it is our brand right so we dad both dan myself alan adam the four um partners we've really invested a heck of a lot into our brand we've got you know on social media we've got nearly half a million followers we've got you know invested into marketing we've we do branding courses we've you know we we really make a point of showcasing who we are so we naturally have a lot of a lot of candidates a lot of clients and people can just plug into that and so the benefit of them not doing themselves is obviously that they can they can we can do all the groundwork for them they can feed off our brand but then they can earn quite a significant chunk of their earnings. Yeah. I might, ask, I might Daniel Mark's website was great. It, was, it looked good. But the, what we've got now is a completely different beast. It's, it's built from the back end by recruitment specialists. We've got marketing that are specialists in digital marketing and uh, uh, all the products and the platforms and services that are, are you know, even, even a large or mid sized recruitment company probably wouldn't be able to have the capacity to accommodate having all of those functions and services and products and platforms but we can do that on scale and every licensee gets to benefit from having that at their disposal from yeah. LinkedIn sites to recruiter license uh, uh, all, all the type of marketing stuff that goes with that yeah so definitely keen to dig into sort of the conversation you've been having down with people around this but i guess also justin feel free to jump in here but dan so i think as a recruitment business owner if i'm listening to this right now sounds great mitigate the risk i'm not paying people salaries i may not even have to pay an office all these types of things right but you actually 
um, obviously put people on this agreement or communicate this agreement to people that you had on a salary, right? Yeah. So let's let's just talk about that for a sec. Like how? Because I'm I might think you know what, Dan and Justin, this is really innovative. This is actually something that I might think about for my own for my own business. How did that? How was that received, Dan, by your team? Old people, they were like thinking, okay, how's this going to work? And I talked them through it. And there's an element of trust. I've known a lot of the people who were with me at Daniel Marks for seven, eight, nine years. Um, and I think they trust me that, you know, I'm a, I know what I'm talking about. Um, and it was a step of faith initially. Um, but everyone, every single person that came over is still with us. Uh, and then we've actually taken on maybe another nine, ten licensees in the last month uh and no one's left everyone's joined and they're actually enjoying it i said the other day i said you know when the when as soon as the placement happens and it's starting to happen quite quickly now um do you want to go back to the old model and it's just i just get a laugh back he's like why would i want to <laughs> go back to getting like i don't know 15 20 25 30 even 40 percent uh, because the salary as much as it is it's nowhere near like if people are building 200 250 300k they're now taking home 180k 200k and I worked it out, and everybody was making double, sometimes three times as much as what they were making when they were on a salary with the commission. Um, because it's just a better model for that. And if, if you're good at what you do and you're self-motivated, um, why would you want to give everything to someone else? And if you do leave, you leave all of that behind. Whereas this is something you can then build up, and when you leave, you can then sell it. Um, it just makes a lot of sense. I think. You know, the people that are, are doing it are now seeing the benefits of it and wouldn't want to go. I don't think anyone's going to want to go back to a, a salary after this. But why, why would you? If you're taking home, you know, 70 percent, 80 percent of what you're making, um, it's a huge amount um, and it, it makes a real difference. Yeah. So initially, oh, my God, what the hell? I'm not going to have a salary to write. OK, let's actually understand last year I built this. If I build that this year, this is how much I'd make. Yeah. Okay. Well, one place like say twenty k, you get fourteen, sixteen grand. That's that's quite a lot of money. And you have, you know, we had some people in the first three weeks who were making placements, and one chap made forty five grand in the first month. So he took home thirty grand in in the first month. That he wouldn't have got anything like that. It had made 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 five uh, or mm. six. Uh, yeah. Uh, 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 but it's we do have like docking like we've got hubs everywhere we've got a hub in new york a hub in london it's a place where people can go and meet collaborate work it's open like 9 30 till 6 and then it's like a jazz bar uh so hope like in so after that so it's like a place for people to go to collaborate to work to meet clients meet candidates we provide all those things for people to do that so they really are it is like working in a, in a recruitment business but you just got more responsibility and more more the reward okay so on this sort of part of communication, Justin, um, we always talk about this in podcasts. Whenever I talk to recruitment business owners about their journey and things like that, a lot of the advice that they give or share is around the importance of defining the purpose of your business and then why you do what you do and being clear on your values. So obviously I, um, I think obviously maybe you guys had slightly different values for MCG and Co and, and Daniel Mark. So I guess from your point of view, Justin, communicating to your teams, right? I know it's not straight away segueing into the licensee agreement as you explained yeah like how did you approach sort of communicating the purpose of this sort of collaboration right because that would have been important that that went right and how yeah. important was it defining the yeah. purpose for dmcg global yeah i think so we've uh, the foundation that the business was was set up and was was basically if you go back to that story i told you and why i got into recruitment it's because I came from industry and realized that people didn't really know what I did. So it was always at, around integrity and being specialists in, in our field. And we've always fed off the back of that. And so I have a really good, you know, bunch of specialists who understand our sector, but they all, they, most of them, as I said, it's quite an expat heavy business that I've got. Um, most of them aren't from the country that they actually work in. And probably, that's probably the big difference between what, what I've encountered with, with Dan. Mm. And so there isn't that security blanket if all else fails you can go and live at mum's you know what i mean mm, yeah 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 <laughs> if, if all if you need a visa to be there and you need medical insurance or if something bad happens so it's having some of those conversations some people are you know open to it others are a little uneasy because it's just there isn't the legal framework that can support them um so we were we're looking at building this in building a model like what dan's got into singapore dubai and hong kong but we have to it works as a city before it works really well for the locals so for the singaporeans yeah, yeah that makes sense uh and and in dubai actually they're they're 
basically isn't any Emiratis that work in recruitment. In fact, I have never met one that worked in marketing and advertising. Uh, they tend to sign the checks, not do most of the work. You know, they're, they're the guys that sit at the top. So we, we, we essentially need to help with the way it, it's, it's looking like we need to do it in Dubai. Is we would need to help them set up their own separate business that then plugs in. I'm not going to get down to the complications. Yeah, but yeah. It's, a lot, it's, a lot, it's a lot more difficult. So the conversation I've had with everyone is, yeah, most people are up for it, but they want to know that they're going to be safe, you know, that their families, because we, as a business, we also, you know, we have a responsibility to people if they've got families as well, um, because if they, you know, if they're the main breadwinner, we've got to make sure they're all right. So it's just those little nuances that we've got to try and help them and, and shape with um, in, in an expat society. And just on that, so yeah, completely understand that. I guess it was just more of like, if you had people that have been with you for a, a long time, just yeah. you're going, Hey guys, look, so we're now actually going to become DMCG global. And they're going, hang on a minute. We've, we've worked hard to build it. And, CG and co brand. Yeah. I guess I was just interested yeah. in how that landed, and oh, okay. people listening to yeah. this might be thinking about JVs and stuff like that, but worried about how that might be received internally, right? It was um, there was not a single person that didn't understand why we were doing it, and 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 we we made a point of talking about this from the outset. So I think one of the things I've learned in business and and as a leader is always just to be treat your employees, don't hide stuff from them, treat them as adults, you know, just be straight with them. And so when I started having these conversations with Dan, I pretty much was quite open and honest with everyone about where we were going, what the vision and mission was. Took them on that journey. Yeah. Yeah. Than I've just, always yeah. Been, yeah. I've always been very open. Uh, I, th I think, I, you know, I'm, I'm the sort of person that, that, that has always been like that throughout my life. I, I, I like to, keep people communicated i don't mind showing a bit of vulnerability when things are bad i don't mind um explaining to people what i want to do how we want to grow it people had seen our success people had seen particularly like the long-term members of staff they'd seen we'd given london a go and it didn't necessarily go according to plan um and what we'd learned from that and most people could see that that made a lot of sense yeah okay so um, just a quick one. So Dan, with um, Daniel Marks, how hmm. many how many people ended up working in the New York function? Just out of interest. Uh, in March, we had, uh, well, in February, we had, what, seven people in the New York office, okay. 25 what, what? in London, um, and a couple in Amsterdam. Um, yeah, what I wanted to ask. Was, yeah, everyone was going to the model, basically, apart from just a couple of people in London. What, what I wanted to ask was, and then Justin, um, be keen to get your thoughts on this from a business owner perspective and keen to mm -hmm. go on a recruit recruitment consultant's perspective. But I think from the conversations that I've had on this podcast and, and also just from a business perspective, um, this year has sort of highlighted for some businesses how valuable it has been for them to diversify their recruitment mm -hmm. business. If that's making sure that they don't have free key accounts that give them X amount of revenue, or if that's not being reliant on one country for their revenue, right? Mm. So I think from the conversations that I've been having, there'll be a lot of recruitment businesses thinking about internationalization and diversifying yeah. their business. I think um, 2019, most ambitious progressive recruitment businesses I spoke to would have America on their business plan as, as an area they want to grow. The fees are bigger. Um, and the, the competition is less and a few other sort of key things that always jump out. But like Justin said earlier, when he tried to get start London and it failed, a mm. lot of recruitment businesses do fail, right, in taking their businesses internationally. So I guess what's been your learning on that that you can share with uh, recruitment business owners that listen to this, that what do you think are sort of the, the three most important things in giving yourself the best possible chance of growing your recruitment business internationally that, that you've learned, Dan? Oh, it's, it's very quick. You've you got to like, a lot of time and resource for this. It wasn't a case of, right, let's have a New York office <laughs> overnight. It took about a year and a half of paperwork, filings. Ultimately, it was a 185-page document um, and a 100 grand investment to, to actually start getting this thing moving. Um, I'm on an E2, as is the company, um, which is good to get. It's five years, and I can extend it. Uh, but it, was, it's, 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 it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot, <laughs> uh, a lot of legal um, uh yeah, time, resource, and putting a proper plan together, a proper business plan. Me coming over to, to, to lead it really helped because I was here on the ground and I still am in New York now. Um, London's great and it's got such a really strong team of people. And I was last year I was back to London seven times. Uh, I moved to New York permanently last January, about two years ago now, but I was back and forth before that. But last year I was back in the UK seven times every six wow. weeks. 
for a week. Uh, this year, obviously, I haven't been able to leave New York State for a year, <laughs> um, which is very different. But um, yeah, be, being here on the ground, like Justin found, he was in Dubai when he moved to Singapore. It, you know, it, it can really start to grow it. So having a presence here for me to, to actually be hands on and to help grow it really helped. But I didn't want to leave London alone. Obviously, it's been it's my it's a, it's the core of the company. So I'm, I'm, that's why I'm up at five six every morning because the UK is already five hours ahead of me. So it's UK is is a really strong part of our business, and the US is another part of the business that I'm here on the ground and growing. Um, and we've got merit on the on the west coast and growing the the, the LA and then San Francisco office. But the, like I said, my time was so split: you know, time, money, resource, all of these things, which is why I was, you know, really thinking it would be good to collaborate on Asia. So I was looking at an office in Dubai and an office in in Singapore, Hong Kong, and I started getting processes underway. But then it's another another countries do accounting on another country do all the legals on it there's so much so many so much time and resource into it that i'm like, i've gone west you've gone east justin we can collaborate on this and we've we've got the whole world covered justin what about you what's been your journey with this and, and well, taking well, your... I, I can, while you were talking i was just thinking god what was i thinking because not only did i set up a business after to only two years in recruitment, but I actually set one up in a country I'd really never been to before. <laughs> um, it was, you know, it was, it was, it was a bit off the cuff kind of, <laughs> wow. Um, no, it was basically, I, I, I was in Dubai and it was getting, you know, it was going great for five years and we were, we were really, I, I thought I could, I could, I could do no wrong. I thought I could, everything I was doing was touched to gold. So my natural movement i felt was where's the other expat place that a lot of people like going my side of the world and hong kong was the first one i could think of so we were inevitably when it was when we were looking at bringing expat talent into dubai we were competing with hong kong and singapore so those that sort of mm. triangle if you will was always my idea of where we wanted to build the business and my thinking for london was well we take a lot of talent out of london so why don't we try and put something there and that make that sort of the four hubs but um, once once we realised that London wasn't right for us, we really sort of doubled down and focused on Hong Kong and Singapore. And actually, you know what? Because I'd already built a business in the emerging world, let's call it the emerging world, um, it, uh, there were sort of the nuances and complications that setting up in Dubai that were quite similar in Hong Kong and were quite similar in Singapore as well. You know, there's a lot of red tape. If you're an expat business, you've got to put quite a bit of investment in. You've got to prove that you've been a successful business for two, three years at least you've got to have clients really that you know you can work with or you can bring with you otherwise it's an enormous amount of money but the the hardest thing the hardest thing and it, again this goes down to the biggest irony in recruitment isn't it that it's finding the right people and i you know i always you you, you have to kiss a few frogs sometimes you know what i mean it's um <laughs> it's it's hard to find people that you can trust to run a business thousands of miles away um mm. and that i think that was the the hardest bit was taking the DNA you had in your business and teleporting that to somewhere thousands of miles away and also trusting someone to build and set up a business with the same passion that you had when you had in Dubai. So you've got to find partners. You've got to get them to be business owners. You've got to, you know, trust them to do it in a foreign land because, um, we had, you know, we had a mixture of expats and locals, but most of the leadership we had when we first gave it go were expats. So it was, it was a real, there was lots to learn from it. And as with most things I've found in business, you've got to fail before you succeed. Yeah, I love that. No, some really interesting points there. So I guess uh, core mission statement, core values, things that everyone knows. Um, in fact, in Daniel Marks, we had obviously mission statement and values as well. Um, we've got new mission statement values for DMCG Global, but they they overlap a lot in 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 having the type of individuals who are, uh, who are uh, collaborative, communicative. Um, uh, uh, they like to, um, I suppose. They're commercial, um, but the slight difference more on DMC Global is more the entrepreneurial side of things. Um, but having those mission statements and values that everyone knows, no one got promoted at Daily Marks without living those values, more so than the billing side of things. And although this new this new model, um, the values are very much the same, but adding in that layer of an extra layer of autonomy and an extra layer of commercialism and extra layer of entrepreneurialism. Yeah, so I guess what I wanted to touch on there, so you're talking about from a business owner perspective, some great insights there, Justin, but Dan, from your experience then, if I'm a recruiter listening to this and um, I want to become an expat in a country that I might spend some time in, may not spend some time in, 
like from your experience from speaking to recruiters about going over to America or or wherever, Amsterdam, like what do recruiters typically wrongly assume when taking their career out of the country that they grew up in, typically, let's say, the UK? Like where, where have you sort of typically found that recruiters maybe didn't think about? I mean, a few things that have come up on this podcast is around that, look, that's great, you could earn more money in America, but actually... Uh, don't forget the personal side and you have to put yourself out there if you don't make friends you don't try and make social circles you're going to be really lonely and that could impact your time spent or end up yeah cutting your journey long short so I guess from your experience if I'm listening to this right now and I genuinely love the opportunity or think about the opportunity of taking my career internationally what should I definitely be sort of understanding about that move I think you have to be wary of the fact that people have, like I've mentioned this before, about having professional equity. You've earned it. You've, you've got clients, you've got candidates, you've got people who you know and trust, and they trust you, and you can take that wherever you go. When you relocate somewhere, you, you lose a little bit of that, actually, because you, you don't have those people who you used to work with in that territory anymore. Uh, we've we, we learned that we've got a lot of shared clients, shared types of roles, but you, you, you lose a little bit of your candidate base and your client base. It's a little bit of a reboot from doing your market you have to sort of scale it and grow it again your reputation uh, your relationship so that's a bit of a reset um being in new york the biggest problem i found is just it is such a hectic place it's so caffeinated and commercial we've had like we had a president here for a year and a half like like year before last after a year and a half of being in manhattan he wanted to go back to london back to the uk it was just so so noisy uh so hectic um it's quite expensive and, and it's that sort of culture shock, I suppose, that people want to do it. And then after a year or so, they think, actually, I've kind of done it now. I want to go back, which is a shame for us because it's such a great place to be. But it's not for everybody. I'm sure Justin will find that as well. When people go to Hong Kong, all of a sudden, it's, it is a busy city. Mm. What have you found, Justin, in, in sort of going through this journey with people? Yeah, I, I've, I've found that particularly in, in the areas that I've set businesses up, and the, the, it's just not easy at all, right? For a mm. start, there's, it's setting up businesses in in the locations that I have there's quite a significant amount of investment and red tape that goes into it then once you've got the people there and you start hiring people particularly if you're going to bring in expats from the UK over to say Singapore Hong Kong or Dubai the biggest thing you've got to remember is that they might not have any network whatsoever in that location so not only do you bring them over you're you're not only are you their boss but you're also their kind of dad or you know, <laughs> at least their friend case, and I feel yeah. really sorry for everyone having, imagine having me for a dad and a boss. Wow. Um, but it was, you know, you, you are taking a, a big responsibility there because you're looking after people's medical, you're moving them away from their home. You have to help them, you know, you never to be help them out with their housing or their moving elements that are involved there, it's opening up bank accounts, all the, all the, all the necessary things that they need to do. You, you basically have to go give people an induction to the country. And then if they haven't got any friends there, your social world and your work world are combined, you know, completely together. So you end up sort of socializing and working with people. And it's quite an intense relationship you have with them and you form very close friendships and very close bonds. Or, you know, if people don't get along, you know, the sparks can fly quite quickly as well. So you've got to, it's, it's, it's a real tough thing bringing people out from their, their, their home country into such a, you know, a foreign land. And, and let me just talk about some of the areas that we recruit in because, you know, Japan, for example, I mean, take everything you learn in the UK and put it in Japan. And it's like, you know, you, it's like landing on Mars. Okay. It's, completely <laughs> different. it's, it's, it's the way they work, the, the, the cultures, the processes, the how you find people. There's barely anyone on LinkedIn. You know, it's it's a very different way of working. So it's, you know, I remember, I'll never forget it, when I had a guy training uh, on new people that came to Dubai. And the first thing he used to say to them was, everything you've learned in the UK, I'm just going to tell you now, beyond the basics, you need to forget it because this is a whole new world. And it is because yeah. you're talking to most of our clients in Dubai had 35 different nationalities in them, their offices. So imagine wow. if you're talking to people from all those different countries or, you know, the, the, the way you interact with them, the way you handle them, the way you might think they're being rude, you know, when they actually that's just the way they go about talking. You know, you've got to learn all those things. And it's a blank canvas. It's a real tough thing to learn. So it take, mm. can take people three to six months just to understand the cultural nuances. Mm. Yeah. I think what I'd say, sorry, go on, Dan. It's uh, at least for a year um, uh, right away, but off the bat, it's quite a lot of resource needed for that. And it is, it is a, you know, New York's a great place. It's very, you know, 
it's, it's, it's a wonderful city, but it is very lonely if you don't know anyone. <laughs> so when we brought people over, we, it, it is a case like Justin saying, um, a <laughs> social calendar, taking them to places and let them people find their feet. But this model that we're doing, we, we can't really bring people over on visas because they're not being sponsored. So we're always looking for local talent who have a local market already. And then we support them in that basis. Yeah, sure. I, th I think what I take from that is, yeah, if I'm if I'm looking to take my recruitment career internationally, I'm, I need to meet more than just the per manager that I'm going to work for and things like that, because that's going to be a big impact on people that I might end up spending a lot of time with. Um, yeah. Regardless of not just yeah being in the office with them, but actually they could they they could likely form your first social circle, right? Which you, that could make things a lot easier at the start. Yeah, you and and, and even you know, I didn't. My, I got offered a job in Dubai at the time of the financial crisis, and I could see, you know, my office wasn't far from Lehman Brothers. I could see people, you know, leaving their offices with boxes in their hands. I was like, this isn't the right place to be right now. So when yeah. I got that job offer in Dubai, I went there. But I'd never yeah. actually even been to the Middle East, you know. I didn't even have the chance to give it a recce. And I wouldn't recommend people do that uh, <laughs> because it really was, you know, going into something blind, quite literally. And, and so if you get opportunities to go out there, think about where you want to live. If, if you've got some mates from school, I felt I was, I was amazed by how many people I actually knew from my periphery social circle that were out there as well. And people tend to be very friendly in expat locations. You know, if you mm -hmm. just drop an email saying, Hey, I know Jeff, Jeff said that I should meet you for a drink. Inevitably that person will, will go and meet you as well. Yeah, because I guess a lot of people, a lot of people being in their shoes, right, and know what it can yeah. be like and feel yeah. like at the early days. So what what I wanted to um, ask you, Dan, and and also can come to you, Justin. But when I look at the the people that worked for um, Daniel Marks, a, a lot of the if you look at the average tenure, it's, it's a it's a long time, yeah. right? Um, so we always so you always hear recruitment companies talking about the challenge of hiring new 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 talent. But what would you say have been the sort of three core pin principles for you that has really enabled you to retain your talent and actually keep hold of some of your best staff which i think a lot of the time doesn't get focused on as much right so what do you think you've done or advice for people listening to this that um has really helped you retain your best people well i have to say it just comes down to being good recruitment <laughs> it's like a plumber with a leaky tap we're not a plumber with a leaky tap we we mm. recruit for people of our clients and we recruit for ourselves so we just make sure we hire really really good people um it's not like it's a massively lengthy interview process it's announced that justin would have as well from spotting good people quite quickly we're taking on new licensees maybe one to a week at the moment and there's a lot of people we could be going with and it's how it's how they interact a lot of these chats now these meetings i'm having are on zoom it doesn't matter you can still pick up the vibe very quickly um so it's a, it's a figures are there. Obviously, you've got figures have got to be good. Uh, we've hired people who've had good tenures at places before. We don't people who've had like a year, 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 year. Everyone has hiccups. Everyone moves for different reasons, especially at the moment. But generally, if you're a good recruiter, what you, I wouldn't suggest you move jobs every nine months for five years. There's normally a reason why. So it, it's being smart about who you're hiring. Um, it's been quite transparent and honest at the start about what what the opportunity is and how it's going to work and then providing a supportive collaborative environment where we look after people um, and everyone feels genu genuinely part of a team uh, and supported um, and I I'm here to support everybody as well um, I'm always available everyone knows that so it's just making the right hires and you know looking after people um, and doing what you say you're going to do and being honest and quite transparent and being trustworthy the same things that Justin was saying earlier actually Justin, what, what, what's helped you retain some of your best staff, do you think, that you've done well or that you've noticed has had an impact on retention? Uh, it's attitude. You know, it goes back to that sort of first question you asked me. What's the, the traits that I find in a, in a best traits I find in a recruiter? It's that willingness to succeed. You know, I know that sounds really cheesy and corny, but when I first set up, I really had not a lot of money, you know, like most business um, yeah. owners beginning of their journey so i had to sort of put, put together and i know the guys um that were with me at the beginning of that journey won't mind me calling them that but a, a riffraff pack of people that didn't, <laughs> <laughs> didn't necessarily a bit like me but hadn't necessarily got the 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 longest recruit or well a great deal of experience in recruitment but had that passion and willingness and you know stupidity should we say uh, to succeed and i had a team at one point there was a guy that didn't when i met him he didn't speak english 
uh, I had to teach him English as well as recruitment. Um, wow. And he ended up being our top top uh, salesperson for two years or top, top miller for two years, which is a brilliant story. There was someone that I knew, again, I knew his mum and I thought, well, I know his mum. He's a, he's a good egg. I'll give him a go. And he ended, <laughs> You know, he, he became a, a loyal guy. There was a, another bloke. Actually, he works for, for Dan, um, who came fresh out of uni. Uh, he met one of my guys whilst traveling or in Thailand. I got a bit of luck with him. So I put together this this group of people that were, if you look at it, the common trait was they were really, they had this real hunger and desire to succeed and win. Uh, I took, you know, there was a couple of stories where I took failed recruiters and turned them into really successful ones because when they landed in, say, Dubai or Singapore or Hong Kong and they saw the opportunity in front of them compared to an uber competitive, low, lower margin, really hard business in London, they took they they took it with open arms and they milked it and they worked really hard and they became super successful really quickly. And that was the, the seemed to be the trait that, that ran through everything. Um, what, what makes it quite tough, um, not necessarily if you've got, well, if you've got locals in Singapore and Hong Kong, you'll find that um, they get approached quite a lot by other recruiters because lots, there isn't many great recruiters who are, say, at Hong Kong or Singapore nationals. Uh, I mean, yeah. great respect because it's just quite a new industry. Um, and in Dubai, it's really an expat market. So you, you've you know, you the, one of the frustrations you can have is you can have someone that you're having a great relationship with is doing brilliantly, and unfortunately for personal reasons they might have to leave the country or yeah. their partner might um, be sick or have to have another job opportunity and they they then leave. So you know it, that can be a real sort of um, kick at, kick as well when you train someone up, had a great relationship with them, they've been a success, and you want to build something around them, and then they just have to leave for situations that are really out of your control. Yeah. Um, we, when we uh, I set up Dynamax in 2006, uh, we're just getting starting to grow. It started to build in. It's quite hard to grow a company when it's just you um, uh, on your own. No, you know, no one knows your, your company name and so on. So 2008, I started to grow it properly. That's when the uh, financial crisis hit. So we had this whole steady. Uh, 2010, I wanted to start growing it, but there's no one with two years of recruitment experience because everyone was either pre-2008 because no one was hiring recruiters in 2008, 2009. So we thought if we need to grow this, we can't really afford to hire people at this point who've got five years, four or five years experience. Um, so we did our own grad schemes. We ran three of them over three years and we hired two people uh, in 2010, 2011, 2012. And we put a lot of resource into that. We've had 150 applicants each time, chiseled it down, presentations, really went to town to get the right people for those roles. Um, and th three of those six are still with us today. Um, oh, that's one awesome. a consultant, senior consultant, he's now director, he's now managing partner. So it's, it's making those key hires that we, at the time it was a lot of investment and time and training uh, from scratch and you've, you've watch these people grow now it's amazing to see how they've grown on this journey over the last nine ten years so having a core crew of people who had bought in board and trained up the way we do things um really did help and then after around that you start you, once you've got a reputation and people know you're good at what you do then people start coming to you and you can be a bit more selective but it's quite hard at the start when you're just starting out to try and you know get people from well-established competitors think why would i leave here to go to you guys um fortunately we're not not in that position now but it's that's how we did it we scaled it growing through grad schemes and getting really good people at the grassroots and then training them up mm. so i've got a couple of sort of quick fire questions to end this but before i do justin let me just ask you like you you've you've been in this game for a while now right how dare you are you implying i'm old <laughs> learn a lot <laughs> so like what if you were to go back and start this journey again, being a recruitment entrepreneur, run your own recruitment business, what would you do differently? You know, I don't, that, I can't look back and say I would, I would do anything differently because my journey would be, I, I wouldn't understand the journey I, 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 I'd, have, I'd have taken. I think, I think it's been, it's been, a, it's been an absolute blast actually. I've loved it. And I've, and uh, looking back on it, there's been parts of it, which have been brilliant, you know, opening up a business in Dubai and, and growing that for the first five years was so much fun. Um, and then I had a two or three years of hurt from various things that happened outside of my control from financial, you know, crisis to oil price crashes, to growing businesses, you know, in countries I'd never really lived in before, but I, I you know, from all that failure, I learned how to be successful again. And actually, uh, my my patch, um, should we call it that, my my Dubai, Hong Kong, Singapore patch, even in this year of COVID, 
because of what I learned from those failures has actually had a really good year. We've done the same as we did last year. So it's it's shown me that actually I, I learned from things that happened before and I wouldn't want to change my journey because perhaps I wouldn't have reacted, coped so well in something like this in a pandemic. Okay. Mm. Okay. And what, what about you? Would you do well, anything different? I would say the same thing. I'm quite an optimist. Uh, <laughs> For, for, look for there's always a, a positive in anything if something goes wrong I think, well there's a positive there somewhere if you look for it so I, i'll be i'll be stretched to find something that i'd actually say well that's you bad um i don't know i suppose we could have done this model that we're doing a bit sooner uh potentially uh, it's great it, it, it really really works but uh like like just if you have you have, you have things like we had a, a time you know three four years ago we're growing we had great people we were going on trip work company trips uh, dubai and paris and you know it was a really really fun time of growth and you know we're just sort of firing at all cylinders um uh, then obviously covid hit and we have to kind of retract a little bit remodel reposition and now we're back and we're actually growing at a rate of knots now so it's, it's tricky uh, yeah i think there's the challenges actually make us who we are and if we hadn't if me and hadn't had those challenges we probably wouldn't be where we are now yeah, I love that. There, there, there is one thing I would add, though, that I definitely could have done better. And, 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 and that there is some good people that slip through our fingers that I wish were still with us. And my hiring, my, <laughs> my interview process at the beginning of setting up uh, a, a recruitment business, and even till quite recently, wasn't the most thorough. It was very much a, a gut feel, which, you know, I can't yeah. believe. You're man, I did recruitment for a business and, and, and let, relied on that for so long. Um, so I think I'd have been a bit more thorough in my interview process and worked on my uh, attrition a bit harder. And uh, the other thing is, we weren't so great in our database at the beginning. And I really regret that because those bad habits lasted for some time. So, mm. you know, get, your, get a good database system together and as a leader be someone that uses it a lot and, and it can show others how to do it because i wasn't necessarily the best and that might be because i wasn't you know the most experienced recruiter when i set up yeah. interesting so i've got a couple of questions for you guys to finish this all right so uh first question i'll come to you dan first and then justin you answer it, and then we'll do vice versa so first question is um dan if you could change the industry mm. recruitment industry what what would you improve um i'd probably like to elevate its status a bit more where i don't want recruiters to be guarded as these pesky people um you know ultimately we add a lot of value and the relationships we have so um i suppose it would be putting it more in the realms of what a, like a, a lawyer would be or the, you know raising the profile we are consultants we've got a lot of experience like our lady uh kate for example she works for the account directors she's been with us for seven years, account manager, account director, senior account directors. She's met over 5,000, maybe 6,000 account directors now. That value, that worth that she has from that network of interviewing four or five people a week over the last seven years, that has an inherent worth and a value. And it's the consultancy, the relationship she has. And she might say, hey, I'm representing a great account director. They know we're fine, thanks. But she's saying that I've met 7,000 account directors. This person is very, very good for your role. So. It's, it's, I suppose it was raising the whole recruitment business up a bit so that it's actually regarded as being more of a consultancy um, than, than perhaps the reputation that it has. Mm. Justin, what would you improve? Yeah, I, look, I think the, the reputation thing is the journey we're all on, right? You know, that's why you're partly why you're doing this podcast. We all want to mm. bring best practice into the industry. So, I'm, I just can't stand. I couldn't get it coming. I mean, it's a bit I still can't stand now in recruitment is this transactional element. It's like you know, people just sling, you know, clients going, oh, I'll send it out to 10 people, give a job to 10 people. Let's see what I get back. Ooh, you know, <laughs> I, I just can't stand that. So if there's something I would change, it would be to 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 bring the professionalism in, to actually make people like if, if people are going to call themselves consultants, like that actually means something. You've got to be consultative. You've got to be able to talk to a candidate about the journey thing they're going on, going on. Talk to the client about the industry, the best people in the market, the shakers and movers, who, who they are. You've got to, you've got to actually consult. Use that darn word. Right. Yeah. And. I think I heard I heard someone say this analogy that you wouldn't you know you wouldn't give your expense receipt to ten different accountants and pay the first person that sends you the sends you the um, uh, the tax receipt back. <laughs> you just wouldn't do that, right? So why yeah. do we do that in recruitment? And that's the bit I want to try and eradicate is get that 
you know, r raise the reputation and bring in the consultative element. Yeah, I love that. You know, that sense what I'm saying. Like people wouldn't go and buy like a Gucci bag and go, it's three and a half grand, I'll give you a grand for it. It's like you just don't you don't you don't haggle on things like that. I mean, you wouldn't go to a doctor and go, Well, can you do it for half price? Or so I'm gonna go to the cheapest doctor or the cheapest lawyer because they're cheap. Um, so it's, it's raising that status. Um, I think we're on the same mm. page, Justin. Yeah. 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 So um Justin, let me come to you with this question then first. What book have you read that has had the biggest impact on you oh man you put me on the spot here books my my um uh, my, my book collection is not is not something that i'm very proud of it's uh I, oh wow i think actually Maybe like, something I listened said, to watched or it could i'm gonna turn this question on its head right because i i'm i i've really got into one thing that the um pandemic's got me into is i audio books and actually listening to podcasts. right there you go yeah I wasn't a massive listener to any podcast till I till essentially this year happened, and I started listening to different business people talking about their success and failures, their vulnerability, and I've really enjoyed listening to people like Martin Sorrell. I think he's got a hell of a story. Um, you know, the recruitment stuff like James Kahn, I autobiographical stuff I find really interesting. I, I, I'm not so much a good fiction reader, so James Kahn. Um, his, you know, his book, I thought was you know, particularly if you want to get into recruitment, you've got to read that. Right. Um, Greg Savage, he's pretty interesting. He's got quite a lot to say for himself. So uh, the, the bit I've, I've really enjoyed is, is listening to entrepreneurs set up and build their businesses and listening to people talk about their success and failure. I like it. Dan, are you a reader? Are you a listener? What? Um, I what? used to, uh, when I commuted into London, I had a quite a long commute. I just, I got a Kindle. I just chew through books. Like, I don't know, two a week or something. I'm, Jesus, a load, a load of books. And then when I stopped, I moved into London again, um, into North London. I, I, the Kindle just died about. I haven't used it. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Um, I listen to podcasts more when I'm when I'm walking in into town. Um, I'd say actually, I'm more read of uh, like the butterfly between all the different sort of media outlets, like the Economist and things like that. I find them fascinating. Um, I think like most people, attention span is quite short now, so it's jumping on an article, reading that LinkedIn insights articles, the Economist. Um, me and Justin often sharing articles and things that we've seen. Even last night at I know. 11 p.m. my time, midday for you. You were we were sharing articles, weren't we, around this latest acquisition of Slack and uh, yeah. you know, um, yeah. Sort of. I suppose me, it's more like business business stuff uh, and uh, relevant industry stuff that I find like bite size that I can I can chew through and learn from. Okay, the, the, uh, these, these podcasts, mate. I, I I picked up two coaches and a and a personal branding expert from listening to <laughs> you being one of them. So I, <laughs> it's, it served me pretty well. I've got two more questions for you guys, then we'll we'll end this. So Dan, back to you. What did you spend your first biggest commission paycheck on? Oh, crikey, <laughs> shit. This is <laughs> this has been bad when I first started. Then um, <laughs> I think I bought a Vespa. Yeah, yeah. Because I was living in Putney, I was living in Fulham, and working in Hammersmith, and it was a it was a thirty minute walk or, or a five minute Vespa scooter or six minutes if I hit the lights. So I bought a Vespa, and it was it was two and a half grand. It was love like that green. Uh, what's it called? Like a racing green brown leather. And I, uh, yeah, it, I nearly died several times um, nipping from Fulham to Hammersmith around that bus station. Uh, but yeah, I bought that and it saved me quite, it saved me an hour a day and it was actually really fun. Love that. Justin, oh, you? Mine's definitely not as glamorous as that. Uh, my, my, mine's paying off a credit card and going, on, going to Ibiza and getting in more debt again. That's, that's <laughs> <laughs> uh, probably a couple of near death experiences mixed in there. But <laughs> <laughs> love that so final question guys and that is justin first to you what what is the ultimate goal for your recruitment career me yeah yeah look i think it's to it's to continue to build on this credibility aspect i think we've we've really i think if you look at our business now we've got 10 offices we've got like 60 people We've got a really nice name for ourselves. So if we can, we've got a brilliant platform to grow from and we've managed to survive and thrive in a pandemic year. So if we can do it now, I think the next 10 years are going to be dead exciting. And it's, you know, it's to build something. I, I, I'm not of this mindset of building something to sell. I want to build something to enjoy and have a series of mini retirements whilst doing it. There you go. Love that. Dan? 
I mean, I was working out, we, we, we placed literally thousands of people over the years. Um, and that's obviously something we're quite proud of doing. But my, right now, I'm really proud of that we're able to, I'm looking forward to launching like 100 businesses. Because these 100 people have their own businesses that they can then develop and grow and then ultimately sell and go on to lead another life or do what they want to do further down the line. So um, I think for me, it's being able to uh organize this and, and, and manage it in a way that people are able to develop and grow their, their businesses um successfully um you know we're not here to take over the world like you know amazon or walmart but we are here to to scale it in the right right ways and get the right people on and give them the opportunity to to succeed and ultimately those people go on to help other people to succeed so it's uh we're like catalysts here making things happen so we're we're, we're i just want to keep on doing that really just be that catalyst Love it, guys. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks. Thanks.